Uh, Alice Morley is a Marine Conservation Officer at Kent Wildlife Trust with a background in marine environmental management. Throughout this talk, we hope that you will learn more about the exciting variety of marine life we have around the Thanet Coast, which is often hidden beneath the waves. We will discuss some of the local species that we can see on the shores across Kent, as well as the different habitats that species call home. This talk will touch upon the historic and cultural aspects of some offshore sites around the North Kent coast, and we'll discuss the importance of marine conservation zones and how they can help to protect and preserve our fascinating marine environment for future generations. Following Alice's presentation, Louise Beer and John Hooper of Supercollider will observe marine objects under a microscope, so that will be really fun. And so Alice, if you would like to start your presentation. Great, yes. Okay, so hi everyone. First of all, thanks very much to uh, Louise and John and Mel from Super Collider for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I saw a few of the places pop up in the chat box about where you guys are from, so that's brilliant to see so many local people um, you know, clearly have a passion and an interest in Kent, so that's, that's wonderful to see. Um, some of what I'm going to be talking about is not just relevant to Kent, but to other places across the UK as well. So I saw some people saying they're from Southampton and Cornwall. Some of this will be relevant, of course, to you guys as well. So it's really apt that I'm giving this talk today because as some of you might be aware, yesterday was World Oceans Day. So a celebration of all things marine and oceanic. So yeah, it seems quite apt that, um, that you've all decided to tune in today. So that's brilliant. So when we think of exciting marine creatures, um, we often tend to think of the more exotic places, places in the tropics and you know, the, the scenes of the bright and beautiful coral reef ecosystems that we see in nature documentaries. As Mel uh, said in the introduction, in this event, I'm going to be talking about some of the amazing marine life and habitats that we get a lot closer to home, just on our doorstep in a lot of cases, and um, particularly focusing on some areas of Fanny and the North Kent coast. So although some of the species I show you today uh, might not necessarily be as strikingly beautiful as some of the scenes that we get from, from the Blue Planet and other nature shows like that, they're no less important. Um, and hopefully you'll learn at least a couple of new things about some of the UK species. So, just a little introduction about what I'm going to be talking about. So I'll start off talking about some um, particularly charismatic species that we get in Kent. Um, I'll then talk a bit about some of the marine mammals that we get around uh, the UK coast. We'll talk a bit about invasive species as well, uh, because that's really important from an ecological point of view when we're considering the ecosystems. And then talk about some of the important coastal habitats, so where some of those charismatic species live, places they call home, and talk about the marine conservation zones. And then as Louise and Mel said, we'll finish with some close-ups. I'll help you to identify some of the common species that you're likely to find when you go to the beach. And then we'll have that live microscope session. So hopefully it should be a really fun evening. So just to start with then, in terms of the charismatic species, um, I basically just picked some of my favorites. So I tend to go out onto the coast quite a bit with my job which is fantastic, um, and I do get to see some quite cool species, um, which hopefully some of you guys will, will have seen as well. So the first one is this one, the small spotted cat shark, slightly confusingly also sometimes known as a dogfish. Now this is, I think it's really cool because a lot of people when you're talking to them sometimes aren't actually aware that we do get shark species around Kent and around the UK. This one is one of the most common shark species that we encounter. Sadly, we often only encounter them once they have died and washed up on the shore. But they are relatively common and um, their populations aren't thought to be uh, in danger or threatened particularly. So the fact that we're seeing lots of them wash up isn't necessarily a sign that they're all dying for these terrible reasons. Sometimes it's a good thing because it means there are lots of them that they're actually washing up. So this species can grow up to around about 80 centimetres long. Um, as you can see, it's around about a greyish or light brown in colour with some mottled spots running all the way along its body and fins. 
Cat sharks tend to hunt at night um, and they feed mostly on crabs, whelks and some of the benthic fish such as gobies. Interestingly, the skin of this cat shark, um, this species, used to be used as sandpaper. So if you stroke the shark from the head to tail, then it feels really smooth. But if you go the opposite direction, then it feels really rough, which is why it had that purpose in the past. So this one is, I think, my all time favourite. When people ask me what my favourite species is, um, I, I would tend to say the blue ray limpet. It is absolutely gorgeous. Um, these live on large kelp seaweeds, which live in the low tide area. So you do have quite a short um, window of opportunity when you're likely to encounter these. And um, so if you do want to go and try and find one, look for the big kelp seaweeds and try get down at the lowest possible tide and you might get lucky and see one. They are also very small, which also makes them difficult to spot. And they only grow up to about 15 millimeters in length. So really, really quite small. And as you can see, they are really striking because they've got the blue fluorescent stripes all the way across, across the, um, the exterior there. They're very um, easy, easy to identify. I think you're unlikely to mistake that for anything else. And they are really cool if you get a chance to see them. We also get starfish. Um, now starfish are interesting because they belong to a particular group of animals called echinoderms and of all the phyla of animals all across the world, echinoderms are the only ones that are entirely marine. So a lot of the other groups of animals you can get terrestrial, freshwater and marine varieties, but starfish belong to echinoderms which you only get in marine environments. Starfish can be found on a variety of different shores including sandy and rocky shores and What's really cool about them, and um, one of the reasons why I included these, is because they're able to regrow their limbs if they lose one. So seagulls and other birds tend to try and eat starfish. Sometimes um, the starfish manages to, to get away, but it might lose an arm in the process, but it's actually able to regenerate and regrow that arm um, and allowing it to survive. One of the best places around Kent where you can find starfish um, is around Minnis Bay and the Plum Pudding area. So if you're out that way, have a look and uh, you might be able to find some starfish too. Now the stalk jellyfish is an interesting one as well. Uh, similar to the blue ray limpet, you are very, very lucky if you find one of these because they are quite rare. And again, they occur at low tide, so you don't have very long. If you're out looking for them, you don't have very long before the tide inevitably pushes you back up the shore. These can be red and green in appearance. Um, and as you can see from the picture where the stalk jellyfish is silhouetted against the hand, these are really tiny as well. So they grow to a maximum of five centimetres tall. So you have to kind of get your eye in. And often they are camouflaged amongst the seaweeds that they live on as well. So when you think of a jellyfish, not necessarily of stalked jellyfish, um, but they are actually types of jellyfish. So people think of them as kind of like upside down jellyfish. So they're attached to the seaweed and then they stick their, their arms into the water column. There's eight arms and each arm has hundreds of these tiny little tentacles which is waft around in the water column bits of organic matter that are in the water column. So another interesting species that we get around Kent is seahorses. So again, people are sometimes quite surprised when I say we get seahorses around Kent. They're kind of thought of as exotic species. These have been seen in uh, shore search dives, uh, sea search dives around Dover, which was quite rare when that was first found because Dover is very busy and there's lots of shipping and, and industry around that area. So it was fantastic that, you know, the, the seahorse can survive in those areas. It's thought that the, generally the populations of seahorses are, they're quite vulnerable, which means that seahorses are a protective feature of some marine conservation zones, particularly um, around the south coast. So some of you may be familiar with Studland Bay, that is protected um, in order to protect the seahorses. 
Seahorses have also been recorded in fish surveys in the Thames as well, uh, which is a great sign and that the populations are starting to recover. They use their tail um, in order to cling to seaweeds and seagrasses, so you'll often find them in those habitats. Uh, and even though they are fish, they're not your typical fish and they're not actually very good swimmers, which is why they have to hold on um, to the seaweeds and the seagrasses. So on to the marine mammals. So we get quite a few visitors in terms of marine mammals coming to visit us in the UK. Um, it's thought that seven species of dolphin have been sighted and recorded in British waters, including things like the bottlenose and the common dolphins, and even occasionally orca, which is the biggest of the dolphin family. So that's always really exciting when you get sightings of, of those things. And of course, you may remember, we do sometimes get interesting visitors coming up the Thames and across North Kent, um, such as, was it Benny? Benny the Beluga. Um, me and a couple of friends tried to go see Benny the Beluga from Gravesend uh, when it was visiting, but we didn't get to see it, sadly. So one that we do get is the harbour porpoise. Um, now this is the smallest and most common of the UK cetaceans. So cetaceans is the, the group of animals that includes whales, dolphins and porpoises. These ones are really small, so the average adult length is only 1.5 metres, so it's really not that big. And this means that sometimes when they get washed up and stranded and people report the stranding, they often report it as a baby. So they say, oh, I think I found a juvenile or a baby one, but actually they don't grow any bigger than 1.5 metres. As the name suggests, they're often found around harbours, so they typically inhabit the coastal waters, which means they're a great species to try and look out for. Although they are quite shy, um, even when the water is flat and calm, it is quite difficult to see them because they've only got quite a small dorsal fin. So again, you are quite lucky if you get to see one. They live for around about 8 to 13 years and like other cetaceans, they rely on echolocation in order to feed and orientate themselves. So, interestingly, the harbour porpoise has to eat around about 10% of their body weight every single day, which means they are always feeding, basically. They are kind of constantly grazing away, much like me during lockdown, so, you know. <laughs> However, they don't eat burgers and your traditional fish and chips. They tend to feed on things such as shellfish, they eat a lot of squid, octopus and various different fish species, including herring, sprat and sand eel. Basically, they'll kind of eat any of those things. They'll take whatever they can get their hands on, um, but they have to keep eating because they have really high metabolic rates. So they have to just constantly um, make sure they've got their energy levels up. Some of the threats to the harbour porpoise is of course overfishing, so because they have to eat so often, if the herring, sprat and sand eel fisheries uh, become depleted, that means their food source is also depleted. Other fishing practices can be very harmful for this species as well, um, not so much here in the UK because it's it's quite well regulated uh, in terms of bycatch, but in other countries across Europe and the world, <clears throat> it, the harbour porpoise can get entangled in the nets, um, which means that unfortunately they die. So that is another threat to this species. It's also thought that um, offshore industries that make a lot of noise, so for instance, uh, aggregate extraction and offshore wind farms, it's thought that they might have um, quite a detrimental effect on the ability of these harbour porpoises to survive and thrive because it means they have to move away from the areas where they would normally be and they get confused because of all the noise that's happening. So some of the other marine mammals that we get uh, is seals. So you may have seen some seals across Kent. <clears throat> We do get two species of seals in Kent. We get the grey seal and the common or harbour seal. Now people always say like, well, how do you tell the difference? And if you're quite far away from the seal, then it can be tricky to tell. But there are some um, key identifying features that you can look out for. So as you can see from these photos, they do look quite different in the face. 
So the grey seal tends to have a longer, more pointy snout or nose, whereas the common or harbour seal tends to have a rounder face. Um, people say the common or harbour seal looks a bit more like a dog. Personally, I think the harbour or um, common seal is the cutest, but that's just, that's just my opinion. Another way that you can tell the difference is because the grey seal grows to a greater length than the common seal. So it grows to a maximum of about 2.1 metres in length compared to uh, around about 1.7 for the harbour seal. The grey seal as well uh, is much more of a deep diver. So it dives to depths of around 70 metres in order to feed and forage for its prey. And critically, over half of the global population of the grey seal actually lives in the UK and around UK waters, which is an amazing accolade for the UK to have you know, such an important population of that species. But it does also come with a lot of responsibility because that means that we really need to look after the seals that we have here. Confusingly, uh, the common or harbour seal is actually less common than grey seals in the UK. Sometimes conservation and ecology likes to be confusing in that way. And another key difference is that the grey seal mates on land and the harbour seal mates in the water. Don't ask me how, I don't know, but apparently they do. There are some um, similarities between the seals. So both of these species tend to feed on fish, um, including cod, herring and mackerel, um, and also they feed on squid and crustaceans as well. So in terms of where you can see them, uh, some of the best populations that we have are around Pegwell Bay and the River Stour. My colleague took this video of the seals at Pegwell Bay, um, just enjoying the sunshine um, and then going for a bit of a swim. And the Goodwin Sands is also a really great place where you can observe them. So we've talked about some of the good stuff. Um, now we'll talk about some of the uh, some of the threats that come from marine invasive non-native species. So just to give a little bit of a background about what this actually means. Um, so for those of you who haven't heard of non-native species, basically these are the species that are occurring outside of their normal or native range because of people. So they might have been accidentally introduced or brought there on purpose. Either way, they are now outside, living outside of their natural native range. Non-native species in and of themselves isn't necessarily a problem. Uh, sometimes the non-native species can coexist and live quite happily alongside our native species. But once the non-native species start becoming a problem and having detrimental impacts in the place where they've arrived, that's when it becomes something to worry about and that's when they become known as invasive non-native species. So this is just to kind of make you aware that although some of it is still very beautiful, um, not all of the wildlife that we find on our shores is native to the UK. So I'll just give you a couple of examples. But the reason why this is important is because it can have some negative ecological impacts. So it's thought that the introduction of invasive non-native species is the second biggest cause of biodiversity loss worldwide after habitat destruction. So that goes to show that, you know, this is actually quite a big, a big issue that we kind of need to look at and, uh, you know, reduce some of those negative impacts if we can. The reason why they have these negative impacts is because they cause habitat degradation and they can alter the habitats as well, meaning that they're less suitable for the native species. They can outcompete our native species directly, whether that's for space or for food quite often. And they can also bring new diseases with them. So the image of the lobster that you can see on the screen shows um, uh, a European lobster with a shell disease brought over from an invasive lobster called the American lobster, um, which sadly has 100% mortality rate in the European lobster. And of course, also from a commercial point of view, that means that you can't then harvest those lobsters and sell them. So it's not only the ecological impacts that we have to think about, although of course, <laughs> working for the Wildlife Trust, that is where my, my main interests are. But also in terms of um, the financial implications, it's thought that around about 
£1.7 billion annually is spent on the management and mitigation of these invasive species, which is just massive. So that's not just marine, that includes terrestrial and freshwater invasive species. But altogether, you know, that is a big, that is a big chunk of the UK economy. And there's also some human health and safety concerns as well that come from certain marine invasive non-native species. So some that we get around Kent include wireweed, uh, which is the seaweed that you can see on that pipe there called Sargassum muticum. There's also one called the brush clawed crab, um, which is the image of the crab that you can see there. And that is thought to be outcompeting our native shore crab. But the, the key difference between the crabs is that the brush clawed crab, as you can see from the picture, hopefully, is that it has a very square body. So if you do see one of those, maybe just take a note of it and try to take a picture and then I can tell you where to send in your, your sightings. And we also have the Pacific oyster, um, as you can see from the other image. Now, the reason why the Pacific oyster is thought to be particularly detrimental is because it's a direct threat to native species. So it's not a threat to the native oyster, but it's actually very detrimental to the native blue mussels that we get, which is shown from that image in the middle. Because basically the Pacific oysters can uh, lodge themselves and, and stick on top of the mussels, uh, which means the mussels then can't open properly, they can't feed, they can't reproduce, and they just get completely outcompeted. And this is a really bad situation to be in because the blue mussels form really important um, mussel beds and, and reefs, um, which in itself is its own little ecosystem which supports loads of other species. So if the blue mussels go, then that's going to be really bad um, for the overall ecosystems. The Pacific oysters can also alter mudflats, um, which can then have implications for the birds, the breeding birds that, that tend to feed out in the mudflats and as you can see they can form really really dense aggregations so the picture underneath where it says invasive and um, that shows just a small relatively small um, area and all of those little white blobs represents an oyster so it just goes to show that they really can form these big dense beds unfortunately they are spreading uh, they're spreading across North Kent and making their way gradually further down south um, where they are likely to impact the mudflats at Pegwell Bay, um, which is a really protected area. Um, so we were really trying to stop that from happening. <laughs> Through Kent Wildlife Trust and also Natural England, we are trying to, well, we were before the COVID-19 situation took hold. We were going out and trying to um, physically remove as many of these oysters as we can in order to stop them spreading, in order to give the native wildlife more of a chance to survive. So, you know, through practical conservation efforts uh, with a group of hardy volunteers, as you can see from the guys in their, their high-vis jackets down there, hopefully we're making some, some headway with that um, and just trying to hold the line and stop them spreading even further. So one of the features where the Pacific oyster can have an impact is uh, on chalk habitats. Now I can't give a talk about uh, Kent and especially the North Kent coast and not talk about chalk, it would be very remiss of me. So chalk habitats are a really, really key feature. And this is because the chalk is very soft and relatively fragile compared to the harder rocks that you get in more typical rocky shores. And the softness of the chalk means that you get a really unique assemblage of species and communities that you don't get in other habitats. And marine chalk is actually globally uh, quite rare, with the UK having, especially England, having a significant proportion of the global marine chalk habitats. So it's really our responsibility to make sure we look after that. Because the chalk is finite, it takes millions and millions of years to form, and that means that the damage to the chalk is permanent. It's not just going to repair overnight, which again reinforces 
the message that we need to protect the chalk that we have. And this includes protecting it from um, boats anchoring on the chalk. We are trying to pass a uh, bylaw working with different organisations to mean that they, boats can't drop their anchors on it because that damages the chalk. And also things like offshore cables and pipelines, making sure that the chalk is protected from incursions such as that. And also any fishing gear that damages the seafloor will, will dredge up the chalk and, and damage that as well. So because it's so important and we need to look after it, it means that the chalk has become a feature of a number of marine protected areas and marine conservation zones around the UK. So another really important coastal habitat that we get in, particularly in Kent and across the UK, is salt marsh. So salt marsh habitats are really, really beautiful. They're often shown on things like country file and um, when the presenters get to go out in a helicopter, they look really beautiful from above. And they're really important nursery areas for fish. So lots of fish species rely on the salt marsh um, in order to safely protect their young. Um, and they also provide an important breeding and feeding site for various different bird species. You may also have heard recently on the news um, or through the Wildlife Trust that insect populations are in massive decline at the moment and it's a very worrying situation. Salt marshes actually support insect populations as well, so it's just another knock-on effect of you know, showing that we really have to protect these places or else it can have very detrimental impacts across all sorts of different aspects of the ecosystem. So a lot of salt marsh is actually under threat and being lost due to sea level rise and one of the reasons why it's important that we protect them is because as well as being great for the fish and the birds and the insects is that the salt marsh actually represents a natural defence and barrier against things like floods and storms. So it can actually help us protect against some of the impacts of climate change. And they're also very important at taking up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as well. As is seagrass. So I've saved this one for last <laughs> in terms of the coastal habitats because this one is my favourite. Um, seagrass is just amazing. So people sometimes think that it's a seaweed, but it's not. It's actually a marine flowering plant. And as you can see, when it's in the water, when the tide is covering it, it is just beautiful. And it is so important as a safe haven um, and a nursery area for lots of different fish species and crucial for things like iconic species such as the seahorse that you can see there. But sadly, seagrass isn't in a very good state at the moment. And it's thought that around about 92% of the UK seagrass has been lost over the last 100 years. So that's a massive, massive amount. Mainly, this has been caused by pollution and damage to the seagrass from boating and also from coastal developments and a lot of nutrient runoff as well from farms. So lots of sometimes subtle impacts that can degrade and even destroy this habitat. But one of the reasons why seagrass is so cool is because it is amazing at capturing and storing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So it's thought that seagrass actually takes in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere about 30 times more efficiently than tropical rainforests, which is just staggering. So, you know, you hear all this thing saying, we need to plant more trees, we need to plant more trees. Of course we do, that's great. But what we should be saying is we need to plant more seagrass. We need to look after the seagrass we've got and get more of it. And that is exactly what a lot of, um, well, that's what some organisations uh, and universities are trying to do at the moment. So there's a few different initiatives happening because people are starting to realise the importance of seagrass in terms of helping us try to fight and combat climate change. We have this solution, we just need to use it and do it properly. So yeah, it's really exciting. And um, yeah, keep, keep your eye out for uh, Kent Wildlife Trust and some of the other wildlife trusts across the South um, and the Southeast, because we're hoping to be able to get a seagrass project up and running. Um, and so hopefully that will happen and it'll be really exciting. In Kent, uh, some of the best places where you can find seagrass habitats is around Sea Salter and the Swale Estuary. So we've 
been doing some seagrass monitoring there um, and trying to see how how it's coped over the last sort of 10 years or so. And um, so the swale estuary is, is a good place um, to be able to see and monitor how the seagrass is doing. So speaking of protecting things and trying to leave the environment in a better state that we found it, one of the ways that we can protect the amazing biodiversity that we get in our seas is through marine conservation zones. So across England and the UK, there are a number of different marine protected areas, but the wildlife trusts and other organisations um, have been fighting for about the last eight years for a coherent network of marine conservation zones across English waters. So some of you may have been involved in that and thank you very much if you uh, supported that campaign. Um, overall it was considered to be pretty successful. We managed to get uh, 91 sites altogether designated which is fantastic. Um, some of the sites weren't uh, allocated, uh, they weren't designated but we are hoping that you know we'll, we're still spreading the message that those areas are still really crucial. We need to look after them. But one of the ways that we helped in order to um, designate these marine conservation zones was to provide the science behind why they should be designated. So we went out and monitored uh, the shore and took part in sea search dives in order to gather crucial evidence and data for the potential sites, which is no mean feat. Um, so very pleased to say that through, through the efforts, um, we were able to get a number of, well, quite a big number of the um, candidate marine conservation zones actually designated. Um, and they were finally announced uh, in May of last year. So I'll just quickly go through some of the marine conservation zones that we get. So I mentioned about the Thanet Coast um, being very important for chalk, which of course it is. So the Thalic Coast Marine Conservation Zone, as well as being designated for the chalk, because the chalk in that area is actually the UK's longest continuous stretch. It's also protected um, for some of the biogenic or living reefs that, that are found in that area. So that includes things like those really important blue mussel beds and also things called Ross worm reefs as well. And the, the lovely stalked jellyfish is found there. Um, and that was actually included as a feature of the Thanet Coast stalk jellyfish. Part of the reason why it got designated, um, because my colleagues and a lot of the volunteers that come out actually found some of these stalk jellyfish and said, look, they're here. This should be why we are protecting this area. So it really does help doing that citizen science and, and monitoring these places. So another of the marine conservation zones, this one is quite a bit smaller. This is the Dover to Folkestone. And this one is protected for a few different reasons. So it's got rocky outcrops and boulders and also various different mixed sediments. So basically some of the cool things that you find here include brittle stars, squat lobsters, crabs and fish. So designated for a few different reasons. That one's a popular dive site as well. And the final one I'm going to touch on in the southeast is the Goodwin Sands Marine Conservation Zone. So this one is quite large. It's one of the biggest across the southeast at 277 square kilometres. And this one is protected for subtidal sand. So it's got those shifting sands, which I mentioned earlier in terms of the seals that are found there. But it's also really important as it supports a number of different species as well, some of which are very fragile and can easily be damaged. So things like the sea fans and soft corals and sea squirts and some of the sponges, very, very fragile and, and very vulnerable. So by being protected in a marine conservation zone, the hope is that people will stop and think, OK, right, there's something important here. We need to look out for it. But the Goodwin Sands is not just important for the ecology and biodiversity, although, of course, that is the main reason why I'm interested. But it's actually a really important um, site in terms of history and culture as well, because it's thought that around about 2,000 ships have been wrecked on the Goodwin Sands. And it's just amazing when you, when you think about how, how many 
ships could be out there um, and sadly how many how many people would have lost their lives out there so it's it's thought that you know it's kind of a mass grave in a way and there's also some uh, World War II bomber planes which have sadly come down in the Goodwin Sands as you can see from um, from the image showing one being lifted out now I was lucky enough a uh, year before last to actually go and take part in um, an archaeological uh, survey with citizen scientists so we went down at really low shore um, at low tide and you can see from the two photos included on this slide that you can see the, the remains of a shipwreck and one of those World War II bomber planes so that was just so fascinating and um, not just from a historical point of view but also because those wrecks now represent an artificial reef and when you look at the species that are there you can see lots of species that because they've got that hard structure they've got something to cling to and these new communities have now established on on those structures so it's very interesting for a number of different reasons so just to finish up with i am now going to just discuss some of the more common species that we find in the strand line. So before I start, um, has anyone got any questions at that point about anything that I've said? Mel, maybe you can help me. <laughs> yes, um, so we have quite a few questions already. Thank you so much for that fantastic talk. Um, so these questions are in response to your uh, talk so far. So uh, Neil says, is there any reason the cat shark skin is like that? And is that usual among fish sharks? And I think he is referring to the um, kind of sandpaper aspects, but please correct me if I'm wrong, Neil. Yeah, no, Neil, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, so a lot of sharks tend to have very rough skin if you stroke them in the wrong direction. Um, and that's because it basically it's to help them swim in the most streamlined way. So shark skin is really fascinating. And a lot of people have studied it because they've made sort of Olympic swimsuits and wetsuits based on shark skin because it's really um, aerodynamic in the water. So, yeah, it is it is like that for, for a purpose, really. It just it helps them navigate and uh, swim around as efficiently as possible in the water. Um, so Liberty just had a comment and she said, I'm intrigued that prophecies only live for 13 years. I always thought that the animals that we consider intelligent live for quite long periods like whales and parrots. Yeah, no, it's, it's true and you can't always tell, you know, you can't always link intelligence with lifespan, although it is something I do, I do that too. Um, but I think it's because they are quite small and typically the smaller species don't tend to live for as long. So things like, you know, some of the larger whales and larger dolphins, they do tend to live for a bit longer, but because the harbour porpoise is small, it doesn't, just doesn't live for as long. Okay, I've got one from Jim Blackstock, Blackstock, sorry. Uh, don't the seals use the sand banks that the wind farm is on? Do they live there? They yes, they. So the, I'm guessing that, that that's referring to the uh, Thanet Extension wind farm. So there are a few wind farms off the coast of Kent, um, and seals have been seen around a lot of those, as have the harbour porpoise actually. So yeah, it's a bit of a debate, a uh, slightly controversial one as to whether the wind farms offer protection or whether they are threatening species of seal and, um, and cetacean. But yeah, they are, they are commonly spotted around there, that's true. So we have a question from Jack who said, do grey seals prey on harbour seals? Oh, no, no, they don't. They don't tend to uh, attack attack the other seals no they tend to just mainly feed on the on the fish and the, the crustaceans i suppose they might try to scare them off because they're bigger if they are uh, you know fighting over the same patch but no they wouldn't eat them 
And then we have another question from Liberty who said, do Pacific oysters form on top of mussels where they are native? Is this just something that they do while abroad? Yeah, good question actually. Um, I confess I don't know that much about the ecology of the Pacific oysters in the Pacific where they are native. Um, but yes, over here they, they smother the blue mussels. Hmm, interesting. So how did how did they get here, Pacific oysters? Were they introduced for commercial reasons? Yes, that's right. Yeah, so they were brought over um, for the aquaculture trade. So basically because we do have native oysters here in the UK, but they live subtidally, so below below the water. They're never exposed at low tide. Um, which means that they're harder to harder to sort of collect. You have to go out in a boat to get them. It's much more difficult. And also they take a lot longer to mature. So from a commercial aspect, it makes much more sense to focus on the Pacific oysters, which grow a lot faster. They become mature quicker and also they're easier to get. And then you can give them to the restaurants. So sadly, um, when this happened initially, uh, the Pacific oysters were brought over and then they released their larvae into the water column um, and the larvae then settled across different parts of the North Kent coast, um, which means that, and then they were able to, you know, settle and survive and then reproduce themselves. That's the theory of how they, uh, how they ended up on our shores in the first place. <laughs> That's fascinating. Um, Jack has said what is it about Goodwin Sands that makes it so treacherous? Ah yeah so <clears throat> I, I think that's because the sands aren't stable so they, they because there is a really dynamic area so the sands are always shifting a little bit within the whole system um, so that means that the, the when you go out and do surveys now you can normally sort of um, work out roughly where where things are going to be, you'll know how deep the water is, where the sandbank starts. Um, but because they shift so much, um, and especially in the days of old when the technology wasn't as good as it is now, it was a lot harder to work out where the dangerous parts were, which is why a lot of ships, you know, came a cropper on the uh, on the Goodwin Sands. Okay, uh, so we've got one from Amanda now. Amanda said, I sail in the Midway estuary. Are there any special species to look out for there? Oh, in the Medway, yes. Um, well, there's the, the Medway, the Medway Swale um, Conservation Society, uh, sorry, Conservation Zone is a very good place to look. So I'd recommend if you look at the fact sheet, it'll tell you all about the Medway. Um, Things that you can find there, uh, seagrass, because uh, it's very close to the swale estuary is found in the Medway, um, as well as just a lot of important fish species. Um, sometimes you do get some seals going up the Medway, um, but not very often. Yeah. Rachel Champion says, is it possible to cultivate seagrass? Yes, yes it is. Um, so it, it is actually quite hard, which is why I think the initiatives haven't taken off so much yet. <clears throat> but it's not unfortunately as straightforward as just going and planting a load of seeds like you would in your back garden. It is a bit more complex than that. Um, so there's lots of universities across the UK. So I think um, Portsmouth, Plymouth, I think Southampton and some in Wales as well. Are really driving the initiative to try and find the best, um, most economical and most efficient way of cultivating the seagrass so that it's got maximum chance of survival. Um, which is which is understandable because you know if people are investing in this initiative, then you want it to work. So as long as the funding is there and the people are still there trying to work out the best ways to do it, then I'm very confident that we'll be able to find a good way of, of cultivating it and hopefully helping it to restore some of its uh, former glory. 
Okay, we've got another one from Jim Blustock. Uh, Jim lives in Thennet. What special species should she look out for apart from the blue mussel? Okay, yeah, so actually Thanet, you, you get a lot of things in Thanet. <laughs> um, so I mentioned the, uh, the stalked jellyfish. If you're able to go down at low tide, you could always try and look out for the stalked jellyfish. It is known to be there. Um, it's got a lot of interesting seaweeds. You may not be that interested in seaweeds, but seaweeds are really cool. Um, so just a, a simple um, ID guide um, should be able to help you identify some of those things. You can also get things like the things like the starfish and some of the other common species like limpets and um, periwinkles, all sorts of crabs, um, dog whelks. Yeah, you know, there's lots happening in the planet. Wow, amazing. So Joshua Dudney said, I'm noticing a lot more birds since lockdown. What impact do you think the lockdown has had on marine wildlife? Oh, very good question. Topical, yes. So I think it's going to have done wonders for the marine life and for, you know, the environment generally. Um, it's thought that although it's been a terrible time, if anything good can come out of it, it's, you know, realising that nature and the environment can find a way to bounce back if we just let it. So I think... Um, one of the things that they've seen is there's been more reports of um, seahorses, not actually in Kent, but around the south coast, so near Poole Harbour and Studland Bay. They've reported more seahorses being found because there's less boating activity happening around there. Um, and also I think it would make sense, I haven't heard this, this is just my theory, but for things, uh, a lot of animals to be able to hear a lot more because there's been less shipping and I mentioned about the importance of using sound in the marine environment. When it's quieter, it's much easier for species to be able to find food, be able to find a mate, be able to navigate their way around the ocean. Um, so I'm really hoping that yeah something positive can come from, from us being in lockdown. There's actually um, a paper that I haven't had a chance to read yet. I only, I only found it yesterday, but it's called The Environmental Implications of COVID-19. So you could always give that a Google and uh, have a little read of that. Yeah, that sounds really, really interesting and imp an important read. And um, yeah, we might be able to send out a link to that as well. Sounds like something everybody should be reading. Um, okay, so... A question from Rachel Campion. Can you tell us what those clusters of dried egg sacs are all over the beaches around the planet? Oh, okay, yes. <laughs> well, a bit of a spoiler alert because that's uh, coming up in one of, the, one of the slides. But yeah, assuming I think I know what you're talking about, they're whelk eggs. So it looks kind of like bubble wrap. Um, they're, yes, they're, they're whelk eggs, which I think Louise may have. There we go. Yeah, so that's a dried collection of, uh, of well cakes. Mmm, has everyone seen those before? I always thought it was uh, a type of seaweed, but it's, yeah, it's amazing. Okay. So Ada says, I recently have been reading Roger Phillips' book on wildlife and culinary relationship. I wonder that the danger that species like seagrass and other species you mentioned are facing any danger of becoming a culinary delicacy. Yeah, so foraging is, is a problem. Um, not so much for seagrass, but for things like sea, um, I think it's called sea cabbage, which you get around the coast. People tend to basically forage for that um, and also some people forage for things like limpets um, and occasionally crabs and winkles. It's a bit of a grey area because it can be sustainable if you do it in very small amounts. So for instance if I take just enough to feed me for one meal every once in a while that's you know probably not going to have too much of an impact on the ecosystem 
But when you think of how many people there are, if everybody did that, that is not sustainable. So our line is kind of try not to. And if, if you really want to do it, maybe just do it every now and then very rarely and um, make a really special meal and then don't do it for a while. And seagrass, I don't think is, it's not edible for people. Um, but I do appreciate what, what you mean. And some seaweeds is being cultivated, um, which again can have some very positive benefits, but also there's the risk that if you take too much from the natural environment, that's going to impact on the ecosystem. Okay, we've got a question from Declan Sean Seamus Connolly. A really great question. Do crabs and lobsters fight? Oh, ooh, that's <laughs> one of those Harry Hill things, doesn't it? <laughs> Who would win? Um, no, I don't, th I don't think they actually fight. They're more likely to fight with members of their own species because quite often they're fighting over a mate. Um, honestly, couldn't tell you. I'll have to go look in more rock pools and this, I'll let you know. <laughs> I would quite like to see it though. I wonder if there's any uh, YouTube videos of uh, crabs fighting lobsters. That's so funny. Um, Rachel Champion says, are there any Planet Marine observation groups we can join? Yes, yeah, so there are a few groups. So obviously, Kent Wildlife Trust um, is, has, has a, a group of volunteers which go out across all of the Kent coast. Um, if you're interested more in the Thanet area, then you could get in touch with the Thanet District Council and they do all sorts and they have a programme of volunteers called their Coastal Wardens and um, so you can go out with them and um, we also have uh, in the summer things, voluntary things that you can get involved with and um, to go find out more things like um, seashore safaris and rock pooling sessions so yeah I'd, I'd recommend looking on the Kent Wildlife Trust website for events uh, once we're allowed to go out again and also yeah, the Thanet District Council for the Thanet, Thanet Coast Project within the council. Okay, um, we've got another question from Ian Buchanan. A couple of weeks ago, there were hundreds of starfish washed up on the shore at Botany Bay. Why was this? So most of the time when you get mass strandings of starfish, um, it's usually following a storm event um, and they actually do, do this really cool thing where they, when they move across the sea floor and it's got the coolest name, it's called star balling, where the sea, where the starfish basically kind of throw themselves into the waves and cartwheel along a little bit and when it's stormy they then get pushed out into the waves and then that brings them onto shore. I've probably explained that really badly, but star balling is a really cool concept. It's basically starfish doing cartwheels and unfortunately that results in a lot of them getting stranded. Gosh, I didn't imagine you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, mainly, yeah, mainly storms. Storms <laughs> tend to be they wash up <laughs> and they naturally form quite big uh, aggregations so it makes sense that you find more of them together. We have another question from Ada who says, How do, how's the best way of recording my sightings? And what is the website or organisation I should look up to log? Oh, brilliant. Yeah, so um, yes, the best thing you can do is um, if you go to the Kep Wildlife Trust, that, that will take you to a page where you can find the, um, the survey form and also the Guardians of the Deep website. So the Guardians of the Deep project uh, very recently came to an end. Um, it was funded by the lottery um, and now we've, we've had to uh, say goodbye to the project. We've achieved everything we wanted to achieve. But if you go to the Guardians of the Deep project, you can find a survey form and you can go out. And if you know roughly what you're looking for, maybe if you've got a good um, species guide to help you, uh, something like this one, then yeah, by all means fill it in and send it to us um, and if we can verify it then, then that's even better and all of that data is really useful because that then goes off to the, natural, uh, sorry, the national database 
and it's just more information about our coasts and it's brilliant for spotting trends and stuff so yeah and also if anybody um wants to get more involved um can wildlife trust do a, a volunteer citizen science program called shore search so obviously that's not happening at the moment um but it will be happening later in the year or next year um, and it doesn't matter your level of experience or knowledge you can anybody can come along and come and explore the rock pools and the shore with us yeah i would personally absolutely love to do that and i uh, had booked on to do one of these before the lockdown so um, as soon as we find out about the next one's happening, once it's safe to do so, we'll definitely share that on our social media as well. Oh, that'd be brilliant. Yeah. Uh, we have a really great question from Buddy Pierce. He said, last year I swam at night in Woolpole Tidal Pool and saw phosphorescence. Is that quite unusual to see this? I've heard of that and I've never seen it myself, um, but that sounds really cool. Um, yeah, so some of the species do tend to kind of glow at night so i think last year we did a nighttime rock pooling session through so that was through um the thanet coast project and i wish i could have gone i i don't think i was in kent at the time but it sounded really cool so yeah that's amazing i'm i don't think it's particularly rare but it's rare for people to see it because not many people are out at night so yeah fantastic Mercedes asks, could it be, oh, <laughs> sorry, could it be true that the water is clearer and cleaner since lockdown? Absolutely, yeah, I'm pretty sure that it is, yeah. It certainly looks clearer to me as well. It's just unbelievably beautiful at the moment. Um, okay, we've got one from Jim Bluster. I often find a sea glass along Margate and Broadstairs. Is this from the shipwrecked or shipwrecks or people throwing the glass litter into the sea? Oh, sadly, probably the latter. So sea glass, yeah, I think it's usually from commercial waste or personal, you know, waste, just people drinking bottles, um, that kind of thing. And then when it's been on the coast for a while through erosion, it it does break down and become beautiful sea glass um but it takes a long time for that to happen um and of course before it breaks down it's still very sharp so beautiful but hazardous melissa hampson has a related question who could you report the digging of shellfish to i saw a couple of times a few years ago two people digging up buckets of shellfish and leaving their empty drink cans on the shore as they went from place to place so yeah that's that's a really good point and that's something that the guardians of the deep project wanted to look at so through that there was set up a group of coastal guardians where people would go out and just on their normal walks along the shore and um, basically report anything suspicious or issues of a lot of litter or people breaking the bylaws and um, doing things they shouldn't and reporting it so you can report it to the Thanet Coast Project or if you want to get in touch with the Kent and Essex IFCA so that's the Inshore Fisheries Conservation Authority they take sightings as well so I think if you just head to their website I think would probably be the best um, best way okay great um, so the next question is from Phoebe Weston is climate change causing any local changes to the coastline? Are there any new species being spotted, for example? Yeah, yeah. So that's one of the really interesting things. When you go out and monitor over time, you, you are able to see trends um, and shifts in terms, of, in terms of climate change, really. So shifting of species. So a lot of that can be seen through the abundance of certain species and the decline of others. Um, and it's thought that climate change is likely to favour invasive species, which of course is, is negative. Um, and because climate change is happening at a much faster rate than the species can, can cope with when it happens naturally, um, they're just not able, they can't keep up really. So yeah, monitoring is, is such a good way of, 
of seeing those trends um, and if you can establish a cause for instance rising sea level temperature rising um, either ri rising sea levels or rising ocean temperatures then you can often see a, a link between the species you're seeing and those trends we have a question from Julie Freeman who says, I heard that the wind farms, although disruptive during construction, start to act as a nature reserve once established, as there are no fishing zones. Is this true? Yes, yep. So to an extent, yes, that's absolutely right. So um, there's a lot of there's a lot of issues surrounding offshore wind as an industry as a whole, um, but mainly the issues are because of construction. Um, and because of the noise and the disruption. But of course, renewable energies, we're in the climate crisis, renewable energies is certainly gonna be a good thing. And if there are benefits from that, for instance, um, you know, more life aggregating towards those, the, the physical structures, because it's safe from a lot of fishing, then that's, you know, that, that is an impact um, and certainly a, a positive one. So yeah, I, I agree with that from a personal level, yeah. Okay, we're just going to have one more question and then we'll get you to finish your presentation. And then when we are doing the moving microscope um, part of the event, we'll continue on from Ian's question. But um, so first, before we do that, Phoebe Weston has a, a follow up from Mercedes question. Why do you think the water is clearer since the lockdown? Well, I think a lot of it is because um, pe people aren't doing very much outside anymore. So when you go out in boats, um, that causes pollution and um, it causes a lot of turbidity. So especially in the shallow waters, um, it basically causes the sediment to, to churn up and um, things become a lot less clear. Whereas if you give it time and the boat motors aren't going, that, that tends to settle, which means the waters are much clearer. Um, and it's not just the visible pollution. As we mentioned, we've talked a lot about noise pollution. That has reduced as well. So you can't see it, but it's still it's a positive impact of the lockdown. And I think also in terms of pollution from lockdown, until recently, um, people weren't really allowed to go out, out of their homes. Um, it will be interesting to see how the levels of pollution change now that the weather is nice and people are allowed to leave their homes a bit more. I'm concerned that issues of um, pollution and littering across the coast might increase. Um, I hope I'm wrong, but that may, may be the case. Okay, great. So, we'll, um, if you want to continue with your presentation, we'll yep. keep Ian Buchanan's question as the first one we do when we're looking at under the microscope. Okay, great. So yeah, um, basically just to finish off the presentation, I'm, I'm just gonna go through some of the common species um, and just help you to identify them. So this one is the edible crab, also known as a brown crab. Um, and as you can see, it's got a very distinctive, um, called a pie crust carapace or shell. Um, which makes it very easy to identify and distinguish this crab from other crabs. And also it's got these really dark black pincers at the end of its front claws. And that's also quite distinctive for the edible crab. These ones are one of the biggest ones that we get in the UK. And the adults can grow up to 25 centimetres in width and they can actually live for up to 20 years, which is a really long time. A lot of them don't actually get to that size because they are um, usually preyed upon um, or you know captured before then. Um, but they, yeah, they can get very large when they are allowed to. They also, um, because they've got very powerful claws, this means that they can target different prey to some of the other smaller crabs that you get around the coast. And um, so that means that these can eat larger mollusks with thicker shells. So things like larger mussels and whelks. So then we have the green shore crab. So this one is one of the most common and familiar ones that we get in the UK. Um, chances are if you find a crab it's likely to be this one. Um, these ones are really cool because they can tolerate quite low salinities which means that these crabs can actually travel quite far up into the upper reaches of estuaries. 
So if you're going around the um, Medway estuary, for instance, then you're, you're likely to see, and you see a crab, it's likely to be this one. So as the name suggests, um, the green shore crab, they are often green in colour, sometimes a bit mottled. And um, they're not always this green. This is a particularly good specimen. And one of the ways that you can tell this, you, one of the ways you can tell that it is a green shore crab um, is through these ridges which hopefully we'll get to look at a bit closer under the microscope. So they've got these five teeth on either side of their shell and they've got these three little bumps or ridges in between the eyes. So if you do get up close and personal with one, just be aware that it doesn't give you a nip um, and you'll hopefully be able to identify it. Now, amazingly, these plants actually, the female can produce up to 185,000 eggs. No, wait, that's wrong. <laughs> I've got my zeros in the wrong place. <laughs> yeah, no, 185,000 eggs. I went right every time she breathes. So that is just a phenomenal amount. But clearly, I can't get my head around. So this follows on from one of the questions that we had about those mysterious whelk eggs. Um, so this shows the sack of whelk eggs uh, next to the whelk itself. Um, so often the whelk shell is what you will find in the strand line. You won't find a live one because these whelks, when they are alive, they live subtidally, which means below the water. So you won't find them even at low tide or very, very rarely at low tide. There's actually more than 50 species of whelk in European seas, um, but this one is the most common one that we get. And the eggs are laid in little capsules um, and produced in like a, a spongy egg mass. So the, the whelk itself produces kind of like a glue that sticks all of those little capsules together. And often when you find them, they are, they, they've been dried up. Um, the common whelks are much bigger than the ones that we do find living on the shore. These ones can grow up to 11 centimetres roughly. And really importantly, the, um, the shells themselves, even though there's nothing, even though often they are just empty, they're very important because they have the potential to provide a home for other species. So particularly hermit crabs may come along and then see that shell and decide that it would make a nice new home for it. So does anyone know what this is? If you just pop it in the chat box and then if, if you guys can tell me, uh, Mel and Louise, if anyone has any suggestions of what this might be. Hi. Some people, cut, Rebecca Huxley, cuttlefish. Yes. Yeah, a couple of other people have said cuttlefish too. Yep. Yeah. Excellent. Yes, top marks for those people. Um, yes, so it is actually the internal structure for a cuttlefish, so known as a cuttlefish bone or just a cuttle bone. So cuttlefish don't have a hard external shell, but instead they've evolved to basically just have this internal, quite soft, um, cartilaginous cuttle bone to support their, their longish body. Um, the cuttlefish themselves live uh, subtidally, so from shallow waters you might be able to see them if you go out snorkeling, um, right down to depths of about 250 metres depth. Um, but it's just the cuttle bones that we tend to find washed up on in the strand line. So this, this is really interesting for the person who asked about the lifespan of the um, harbour porpoise not living for very long but being very intelligent. The cuttlefish, I was actually really sad when I found out that the cuttlefish, it's so intelligent, it's one of the most intelligent marine species we have, and it only lives for two to three years and it dies after it breeds, which to me just seems like such a waste, but you know, nature is cruel. So. These ones now um, are the egg cases, or also known as mermaid's purses, for the thornback ray and the small spotted cat shark. So basically, when they produce these, um, when they produce these egg cases, um, each one has an individual embryo in it. So the thornback ray is the most common ray that we get around Kent, um, as the name suggests. The ray itself has a lot of small thorny spikes on its back um, which makes it easy to identify if you're diving for instance and they're closely related to the typical sharks but they're squashed or flattened 
So they've evolved to just stay on the seafloor, which is why they have those kind of wings. So the thornback ray produces these black egg cases um, and a really good way of, of identifying some of the egg cases or the mermaid's purses, as they're also known, is by looking at the Shark Trust websites. So they've got a really handy guide to help you um, identify which species you might have found the egg case for, um, and also the Marine Conservation Society. And now just to finish up, um, I couldn't possibly have a talk and not talk a little bit about seaweeds. <laughs> so this one is uh, again one of the most common ones that we find. It's called bladder rack. It's a common brown seaweed um, found mostly on rocky shores. The way that you can tell this species apart from others is that it's got these almost spherical little bubbles along their fronds um, and they're known as gas bladders. So that's where it gets its common name from. Um, and these little gas bladders allow the fronds to float when the tide is in um, so that they, they can access more, more light and so that they're not just you know, sort of stuck to the sea floor. They can waft around in the water column a bit through those floating gas bladders. One thing I'll just say, um, when, when you're out looking and say you're, you want to go and explore and see what cool creatures you can find under the bladder rack, um, the bladder rack is a really important habitat and also a food source for a lot of different smaller species, um, mainly the mollusks, so things such as periwinkles, dog whelks and top shells all live amongst the seaweed. So if you are going out and you're lifting some of that up trying to see what cool things you can find, just be careful um, and be conscious that things do use that as a home. So make sure you just put it, put it back where you find it and don't, don't rip it off or, or disattach it. Um, so yeah, that's um, just a few a whistle stop tour of some of the species that you're likely to encounter. And now uh, I guess we'll, we'll go into the microscope. Thank you so much for such an amazing and enlightening talk, Ellis. Um, yeah, I've learnt so much and I'm sure that everybody else has as well. Um, so now we are going to look at three different objects under the moving image microscope. My partner here, John Hoover, will be oh. helping with the microscope, <laughs> in case you didn't know he was there. Um, and yeah, so Alice, when you're ready, if you want to stop sharing your screen, then we should be able to go straight to the microscope. Okay. So the first one we're going to look at, if you can all see me talking at the moment, is this one. Cap shark. Okay. So, yeah. So yeah. during this, feel free to ask questions in the chat box and then we'll, um, we'll ask Alice as we go. So yeah, one of the questions that we had was from Ian Buchanan, which says there are loads of container ships off the coast of Margate in line to London Anchorage. Are they polluting and doing damage and is anyone monitoring their waste? Uh, <laughs> I have to be careful here. Yes, um, basically the less, the less that happens in the sea, the better for the environment. Um, ultimately um but you have to be aware that things still happen we still need to use the ships um we need to import things that's very important for for people um so that that can't just all stop um in terms of how much they pollute there are certain standards um which is usually monitored by the port industries so for instance the port of london authority um has a duty to try and regulate how many ships are coming through, um, what they do with their waste, um, making sure that they use the correct um, anti-fouling substances on their ships, um, making sure they're not using any harmful paints um, and things like that. So there are regulations out there. Um, personally, I think a bit more could be done and a bit more monitoring probably should be done because um, there are a couple of loopholes. Um, but yeah, it is being looked at, but I think it could be done better and it could be done more. Ah, oh, good, good question. What's the twiddly bits on this mermaid's purse? Yeah, so as we mentioned before, um, <clears throat> this is the 
egg case or the mermaid's purse with a cat shark. So they're, they look kind of goldy or light brown in colour and they've got the twirly tendrils on the corners because when the mother shark lays the egg case she'll she'll lay it and then swim around some seaweed or seagrass um, so that that curly bit can then attach itself so they've actually got really long gestation periods so it'll take nine months for a, a baby shark to emerge from that egg case and um, is anyone else singing the song right now <laughs> baby shark so yeah it's fantastic that they are able to actually wrap themselves and anchor themselves onto um, a, either a piece of sea grass or seaweed um, in order to protect that egg case um, in the hope that the, the baby will emerge. We've got a question from EK. Um, if I find the whale kegs on shore, does that mean that I did? Yes, um, <clears throat> I believe so. So yeah, the ones that you find in the strand line are all dried out. Um, either because the most likely because they've already hatched in the environment and it's just the empty egg cases that's been washed up. So not necessarily dead, just empty. We also have a message from Andrea Spencer who says she makes artworks in glass based on mermaids' purses, the egg sack of the cat shark and she's included some of her images on the chat so if you guys are interested in that please um, download those um, and I also had a question um, based on your thing uh, your presentation about bladder rack so I've been using one or two strands um, to make film developer is that um, bad to use that if I pick it carefully um. That's very creative. <laughs> I've never heard of it being used for that before. Um, seaweed's got all sorts of purposes, like even it's thought to have anti-aging properties as well. So people are trying to harvest it for that reason. And also it provides food um, for people. Um, I think if you do it in very small amounts, they, we, we wouldn't encourage anybody to disattach the seaweeds. So we would say that's a no-no. But if it's already dead and washed up, if you take and, and it's not attached to anything and it's not got anything living on it, if you take a very small amount, that, that would be fine. Are there any more questions? Or shall we move on to the next object? The next mystery object? <laughs> Okay, and I'll just show you the inside. Now we'll put it under the microscope. Yeah, so this is a close-up of, uh, of one of the whelks that we, that we just saw. And I mentioned that the, the whelk shell can provide a home for a hermit crab, but as you can see here, it also provides um, a hard substrate and a home for another species as well. So this is, um, these ridges here is actually uh, a keel worm. So I doubt the worm is still in there, but it, it, it's actually the, the outer hard calcareous shell of a worm. So when it's in the water and the worm is alive inside that tube, um, it will basically put out these tiny little sort of tentacles and arms into the water column and filter feed any of the organic material and then bring it back and into its little shell or tube. So they're quite cool. So you might have noticed it on the photo I included earlier with the starfish. There were all those sort of white tubes all around it. They're, they're keel worms. And just, um, just to mention, I've already chatted with uh, Louise and Mel and John about this, but we've, we've brought these specimens and put them under the microscope um, so that you can see them. But we discourage people from taking things from, from the beach. Um, it's absolutely fine to look at them, take pictures, pick them up, feel them, hold them, all that kind of thing. But um, we would definitely encourage people to put things back on the shore when you find them. Um, 
just because it's it's part of the natural environment and it can provide either a home or food or just you know an important part of of nature so try not to uh, to take it away with you and i know louise is going to take these back after the talk <laughs> yeah we'll take a walk down to the beach and put them all back brilliant So is there anything else you want to look at on the shell, well, shell, or should we move on to the ocean street? That's the, the best, most exciting thing, I think, from the, from the whelk. Okay, great. So the next thing is this amazingly beautiful crab shell. See how... Um, Oops. All the beautiful colours. Have it done here? Yeah, so a nice close up of the uh, the green shore crab, which we looked at earlier. So there you go, you can see the um you can see the very characteristic ridges or teeth that it's got alongside. And oh yeah, someone's getting very excited about the barnacles. <laughs> You think you could move move the microscope so you can see the barnacle? I think you can. Ah, there we go. <laughs> Very cool. So again, just it's amazing how so many species are interlinked and live on top of each other, basically. So barnacles are are also crustaceans. Um, a lot of people tend to think that they are um, mollusks, so a bit like limpets, but then they're not. They're actually a completely different group of animals. Um, so this is really a crustacean living on top of another crustacean, which is, which is pretty cool. Yeah, and there's, um, there's also a very uh, small patch of pink coral. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's basically a, um, a pink encrusting algae which you get um, on hard, hard surfaces. So you can get this on um, just on rocks, in rock pools, you'll often see a sort of pink coating um, with the calcareous white edge, um, but it also can, can sort of colonize and settle on, on other hard substrates as well. So the carapace of a crab, for instance, this seems to be now the home for that, for that pink encrusting algae, which is quite cool. A kind of bryozoa. Um, I think it is. Yeah, John, are you able to move up? Do you see? There's some very small little sticky out bits a little bit further up. Yeah, there. So that this, I I'm not entirely sure. I presume this is what Louise mentioned in the chat box, saying is it a type of bryozoan? Um, it might be either a high, possibly a hydroid. I don't think it's a bryozoan, but it could be a hydroid of some sort. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what. <laughs> I can only take an educated guess. But again, just get more things living on on a single shell. It's cool. Okay, should we have a quick look at the underside of it, and just to see what's inside the crab shell? Mm -hmm. Ooh. Looks pretty scary close up, <laughs> but it's in real life. This this um, shell just looks like the most beautiful sort of bejeweled thing you've ever seen. It's just amazing that it's completely natural. Does it smell yet, Louise? <laughs> no, <laughs> that's good. Glad to hear that. Yeah. Doesn't smell yet. Mm -hmm. But we, on our walks down to the beach, we find so many crabs in different, um, well, sometimes they're completely whole, where it feels like the crab is still inside, sometimes they're missing legs, but there, sometimes there just seems to be, we might find 50, they're just everywhere. Mm -hmm. So I think somebody just asked what the what that kind of honeycomb type is. Um, 
so that that looks to me like a bryozoan bear uh, maybe that's what you were talking about earlier um louise in the chat box and um, so yeah that kind of honeycomb pattern uh looks like a type of bryozoan so that's also known as a sea mat so you get different types of bryozoans that again just sort of settle on something and, and then and then cover them that's a really nice specimen of it yeah. but yeah louise some of the um the crabs that you see they're not they're not all um dead so quite often it's because the crabs molted um, and yeah. so the ones where they look really intact you think it's you know from where they've molted so yeah they've just escaped their homes mm. yeah. yeah um how do they get out of their shells um, they open through a kind of slit at the back so at the back of their their underneath and then they sort of push themselves out <laughs> have you ever seen one doing it in real life uh, um no, I haven't seen it live. I've seen a crab that's recently molted because they're, they're really soft when they first come out of their old shell before their new shell has had time to harden. Mm. So they tend to be a lot more shy when they've just done that and because they're soft and vulnerable and they've not got that hard shell to protect them. So they tend to be very, um, very shy at those points. And I've seen them when they've just come out of there and they're hiding under the, under the rocks <laughs> so we left so amazing what kind of life lives in these places where you perhaps don't really think that they're full of life yeah yeah in comparison to like a tropical island yeah yeah very true yeah, yeah. it's just the more, the more you look the more you see it's it's amazing 